just going to record it now. Now, I'd, I'd like to remind everyone that as far as the group discussion assessment is concerned, you only pick marks for the Zoom tutorials if you actually uh, pick up the microphone, your microphone, uh, in order to answer uh, the discussion questions or any questions that I, that I raise. So mere attendance at a Zoom tutorial does not lead to any mark for group discussion. So I wanted to make that clear. Uh, obviously, uh, you join a Zoom tutorial more than just for the purpose of getting marks. You're actually here to try to dig deeper into the, into the topic that we're discussing. Plus, of course, you want to be able to have that feeling that you're actually in the company of your cohort and your community of learners. So that's the end of the reason why a lot of you would want to join a tutorial. But uh, as far as the uh, marks are concerned for the Zoom discussion, uh, you can only pick up marks if you actually try, if you actually answer uh, the questions that I raised during the tutorial. Now, uh, whether or not your answers are wrong, for as long as you make a genuine attempt to answer my questions, you will get the full mark uh, for participating at a Zoom tutorial in the sense that you've actually picked up the mic and answered the questions that I've raised. So we could probably begin uh, right now. And I'm gonna share the screen. Okay, hang on. Okay, so tonight's topic is about the executive and the idea of a responsible government. And after this session, you should be able to discuss and explain the concept of responsible government and provide an overview of Commonwealth executive powers. And we should also be able to uh, obviously address um, the question that uh, Ria earlier posed as to the three branches of government as represented in the Australian Constitution. So we're going to do that by going through the discussions, the discussion questions tonight. Now, um, will there be any questions or any comments before we start uh, going through the weekly discussion questions for week two? Will there be any questions? If there isn't any, then we could probably begin. So. Uh, for question one, what do you think are the implications of the idea of representative government on the power of judicial review? So what do you think are the implications of the idea of representative government on the power of judicial review? Can I get some volunteers? And if you could, um, it will also be helpful to you and your classmates if you attempt to answer that question by posting answers in the chat box. Not that I'll actually be able to uh, go through all of them because I find it difficult to conduct the tutorial and uh, engage with you and at the same time go through the chat box, but we will record what's in the chat box so that can help later on uh, others who may uh, end up going through the recording and trying to go through uh, all the statements that are given in the chat box. Okay, can I get volunteers? So what's the idea, um, what are the implications of the idea of representative government? What do we mean by government? Yes, what would that be? Sorry. Chris Smith. Chris, yes. Uh, well, I've looked at that question. I figured that uh, as far as representative government goes, it means that the, the government's formed by representatives who are directly elected by the people, mm -hmm. whereas it, it, the judiciary is not. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, they're appointed. So mm -hmm. I think the, the line needs to be drawn between the influence the non-elected people can have over the elected so your representative government is supposed to be uh, governing to the will of the people. Yes. And then the judiciary will come along once decisions have been made 
mm -hmm. who uh, determine if they uh, comply with the constitution for a start and then any um, uh, any case law and, and that type of stuff afterwards. Okay. So what would be the implication of the idea of representative government on the power of judicial review? So that begs the question of what exactly is judicial review? From what you would have understood by now, although yep. you only just started to discuss constitutional law, what do you suppose is the effect of uh, the idea of representative government on the power of judicial review, which is the power of the uh, judiciary to review certain legal questions? And I'm, I'm stating oh. it in a broad sense. Yeah. I, I sort of thought that, that, that this question here and the next one were very, very closely related mm -hmm. uh, in that, that it's not the job of the judiciary to make decisions within representative government. It's purely their, their role to uh, review decisions that have been made should there be conflict of, about those decisions. Mm. So I guess, the, of, I guess the implication of judicial review is that um, a representative government shouldn't be um, checking itself and the judiciary shouldn't be trying to influence uh, the representatives in government as well. Okay, so when we speak of decisions by the executive, for example, what kind of decisions would this be? Because there could be many, uh, but it could be a decision by the executive, for example, to try to expand the powers of the police so that they would then be able to, let's say, conduct uh, searches of people's and of their vehicles. It may be decisions about uh, what government benefits should be given to people through the Medicare. So what kind of decisions are we talking of in relation, for example, to the power of judicial review? Uh, well, the way I've seen it so far is the judicial review looks at uh, actual legislation and laws that are passed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, are we saying, therefore, that uh, if the executive or the parliament passes a law, would that mean, therefore, that because the executive and the uh, members of parliament actually are the uh, representatives of the people, the, the, the judiciary, therefore, will desist from reviewing any law that they pass to, in order to determine whether or not they are legal or constitutional. Is that the effect? That because, uh, you know, the parliament and the executive are representatives of the people, therefore, any, any law that they pass is beyond the purview of judicial review. Absolutely not. Not under our system okay. anyway, because we have the constitution sitting above all laws. Uh, okay. The judicial review would only occur if there was some conflict. Uh, so if a law was passed and no one was too concerned about it, it would probably just continue. But if, so, if a law was passed and it influenced someone and they felt the need to challenge that law, okay. then there would be a judicial review. But the, the government and the elected uh, members basically can pass whatever laws they want. And it's not until there's some type of conflict between a party or a person uh, that the judicial review would occur. Okay. So let's assume that a law has been passed and a law, in fact, affects people. So yep. there's actually a dispute that's involved. Yep. The question then is, is it actually within the power of the judiciary to review those kinds of laws? Or not on the on the big uh, notion that you know any law that is passed actually embodies the decisions of parliament and the parliament is the representative of the people would it mean therefore that the law being an embodiment of the decision of the representatives, representatives of the people then that then those any law therefore becomes uh, beyond the pale of uh, judicial review is that what we're saying no definitely not that the okay. any law that's passed would have uh, the right to a judicial review. Okay. Well, uh, yes. Just Thank one you. thing. So the, the representative government. Yes. Uh, that that could be legit, legitimacy because it's it's representative of the people. Mm. But judicial review uh, allows superior courts to uh, assess or validate the legality or constitutionality of a law made by the, the responsible government. Okay. 
so we know that the judiciary has the power to review certain decisions as in, of, the, of the executive or even of parliament as embodied in laws or even as embodied in whether in policies or regulations passed by the executive. Now, the question I have really is this. To what extent would the judiciary actually review decisions made either by the executive or the legislature as embodied in laws that they pass? And when I speak of laws, I'm speaking of laws broadly. So this could be statutes which are passed by parliament, or it could be in the form of regulations, uh, which is subordinate legislation. Or it could even be in the, form, in the exercise of um, prerogative powers by the executive. In other words, the executive, remember, has powers of its own outside of the constitution. It is inherent within the executive to be able to, to exercise certain powers which, is, which are not necessarily uh, linked to the Constitution. So in other words, even in the absence of a Constitution, we recognize that the executive has certain powers. So power, the power, for example, to enter into treaties, the power, for example, to enter into contracts, the power to uh, make decisions as far as the military is concerned, you don't need the Constitution for that because it is an inherent power within the executive. Now, the question I have, therefore, is this. To what extent, therefore, would the judiciary be able to review decisions of either the executive or the legislature? Given the fact that the legislature and the executive are meant to represent the people. Well, to, to have judicial review, the person invoking that has to have standing. Okay. To, to Review. Is that where you're heading, Manjo? No, my question actually is, is the judiciary, does the judiciary have the power to review all kinds of decisions, either by the executive or by parliament? Or are there certain questions that the judiciary will refrain from entertaining, even assuming that there is an actual controversy and there is somebody with legal standing? Are there certain questions that the judiciary will not involve itself with? Well, the judiciary won't, won't entertain whether or not a law should be made. They won't get involved in, in the legislature uh, in their process in enacting the law. It'll only become, uh, they'll only become involved afterwards if a law is made and someone has standing to, to argue or... or, <clears throat> or uh, have some issue with the legality of that law, but the judiciary won't be involved in saying whether or not that law should or should not be made at the first part. It'll only become involved afterwards. Okay. Um, thank, thank you. Is my question quite clear? Because I'm still not getting the answer I wanted. Are you looking for the uh, concept of if the um, general public go to a referendum based on the constitution to change the constitution or anything, and that is passed through that process, then it, it will, shouldn't undergo a judicial review at that point? Um, actually, the, judici the judiciary would have the power to review whether or not uh, an attempt, for example, to engage in a referendum has actually been done according either to the laws passed by parliament or according to the constitution. My question is this. For example, what if parliament passes a law saying that, um, that those who, have, um, who are single moms should not be entitled to uh, any benefits? Or they would say that or let, let's say a law is passed by uh, parliament uh, as uh, approved in, in coordination with, with the state parliaments, whereby there is now limited funding for education. Or let's say there is a law that is passed saying that as far as uh, the development is concerned, they would provide a smaller budget to let's say Tasmania. So those are decisions made by, uh, you know, representatives of the people. These are decisions that are made by the, part, by the prime minister and his cabinet. 
and they influence obviously the agenda of the parliament. So in that sense, certain laws are passed. So my question is, in, in relation to those three concrete examples that I gave, do you suppose that the judiciary would have the power to review those decisions as embodied in a law? Hi, Menger. Oh, yes, sorry. would that be? Sorry. Um, tell me if I'm on the right track, but I think it's um, the... Oh, yeah, Tiffany, the yes. Judiciary. Yeah, they're not concerned with say demerits or the outcomes so they're just concerned with the legality so they don't they're not determining you know what the outcome of this legislation is as long as it's legal so basically the government can make laws on whatever they like as long as it's not infringing current rights under the constitution is that on the right track um yes it would be in one sense that's right i mean but you talked about the notion of merit review, and I don't want to get into it yet right now because um, that, that's not the thrust of my question. In relation to the three examples I gave, my question really was, do you suppose that the judiciary is in a position to review decisions made as to who gets benefits, decisions made as to you know, how the budget uh, is going to spread, be spread out in terms of the sectors or the way that uh, the government is, gonna, is going to allocate uh, budgets to the different states. The question is, assuming that the parliament and the uh, prime minister and his cabinet uh, pass legislation in relation to those three issues, would it be uh, possible for uh, the judiciary to review the legality or constitutionality of the decision? So if, let's say somebody complains that those decisions are, um, are unlawful because um, they they probably represent a, an, an unlawful exercise of uh, legislative power because it goes against um, you know, the rights of, uh, of uh, single women, for example, to be supported by government. Well, Mendo, I don't think that a court would review you know, such circumstances. I mean, that's the role of the government uh, to introduce legislation. I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, the main um, you know, uh, area that they, they, they would, under, you know, would conduct a review would be to assess whether it's in their constitutional limits, mm. um, that sort of side of, side of things, because um, they're not actually, actually concerned with the merits of the legislation. Um, well, that's my understanding anyway. You know, they'd mainly be concerned about whether it is constitutional, um, that sort of, you know, debate. Okay. Um, two aspects, because the, 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 the idea of merits keeps on coming up. When we speak of merits, for example, the notion of merits is typically associated in relation to administrative law. And for that matter, I'd like to highlight the fact that the, 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 uh, the topics for the first three weeks are actually relevant to those who will be taking up um, administrative law later on. Now, in relation to administrative law, when we speak of merits review, we, we, re we specifically refer to mainly the factual issues, whether or not you know, the allegations of fact um, might actually be correct as determined by a tribunal. Uh, and when we speak of an administrative tribunal, it actually means that these are not chapter three courts. These are actually tribunals as created by the executive and who report to the executive. And in relation to administrative law, therefore, courts will not uh, review the merits of decisions of whether or not the decision is actually correct on the basis of policy, because the courts will limit themselves to the question of legality. Now, now so let me just go directly to the point here. What I was actually trying to drive at that there, is that there are certain questions, and these are called political questions, that the courts will desist from entertaining. So. Political questions are those questions which actually involve questions of national policy, questions of government agenda, questions of government priorities. So these types of questions, which involve decisions made by representatives of the people to determine how Australia, for example, should operate as a nation, these are political questions that are best left to the representatives of the people, meaning by the prime minister and his cabinet or the parliament. And in relation to these types of questions, these types of which are political questions, 
the judiciary will, ref will refrain from determining whether or not um, they are legal or constitutional. So questions, for example, uh, whether or not it is lawful for the prime minister to enter into a treaty with North Korea, given that North Korea is a communist state, or whether in the past uh, it would be legal for uh, for uh, Australia to enter into a treaty, let's say, with South Africa when it was then practicing apartheid. In these instances, these involve political questions. And although they may touch on questions of legality and constitutionality, still, because ultimately they, they uh, involve political questions or questions that are best left to the representatives of the people, uh, representatives of the people who have been elected by the people, it means therefore that the judiciary will refrain from entertaining um, applications to review those types of decisions and will refrain from rendering a decision as to whether or not they are legal or constitutional. Okay, so let's move on to uh, the second question. To what extent, so it's actually related to the second question and that's there. So to what extent do you think may the judiciary and institution composed of appointed judges review political decisions? So the judiciary in relation to, to question two, the judiciary will refrain from uh, reviewing political decisions. So that's related to question one. So let's move to question three. Now, why is it said that it is by convention that a government that loses the support of parliament must, must resign? And so therefore I highlight this question because earlier um, we had a question by, I can't remember who it was, Ria, I think, who pointed out that you know we have the constitution and this is how the powers uh, of government are actually um, stated in the constitution. And I said that uh, we can't limit ourselves to the constitution because to do so might end up misleading us because the when we talk about the framework of government of Australia, we don't limit ourselves to the constitution. And an example is the notion of by convention. So when we say that it is by convention that a government that loses the support of parliament must resign, what do we mean by this? And I'm looking at the phrase by convention. What exactly does that mean? Anyone? Well, by convention, yes. um, who would that be? I, I need to get the uh, name because I'm trying to monitor um, for group participation. Yes, Karen Longhurst. Yes, right, Karen. Yes. Um, well, it means but by convention means that it's probably not actually written down. Mm -hmm. It's just the way you've already always done it, and so it becomes an unwritten rule as opposed to a written rule. Okay, so we're getting there. And so there are certain unwritten rules, certain practices. Who's practicing what? Unwritten rules and practices by whom? Well, in this case, um, that uh, the, the government um, who has lost the support have said, well, we will resign as a government and therefore an election needs to be held. Mm. Okay. So we might say that they are constitutional conventions in the sense that although they're not properly written in the, they're not part of the text of the written constitution itself, they carry the weight of a constitution given the long-standing practice, mainly both by the executive and parliament. So there are long-standing practices that have carried the respect and observance of both the executive and parliament. And they're deemed to be constitutional convention because they carry the weight and authority of the constitution, even if those practices and observances are not actually written in the written constitution itself. So that is an example. So because of long-standing practice and observance by both the parliament and the executive, there is a convention, there is that practice where a government that loses the support of parliament must resign, although it is not in the written constitution. It may not even be uh, in any um, standing rules of parliament, but it is a, something that is observed. 
in the same manner that we have um, conventional practices in relation to the, uh, the, the power of the governor general to remove uh, a, the prime minister. So let's assume that, uh, let's assume that the prime minister, for example, loses the support of parliament and let's assume that the parliament refuses to resign. What then? So the first question that, that the first question that it raises is, if somebody were to uh, file an application with the high court or with the federal court in order to question the continuing in office of the prime minister and his cabinet, the first question that is raised is, would the judiciary entertain such a question? And let's assume that that application would have been uh, in relation to a question that since the prime, the prime minister and his cabinet have lost the support of parliament, they, they, therefore they don't have any legal right to be in office and therefore they cannot pass uh, any regulation or any policy that affects the people. So in that regard, there is standing on the part of a, an Australian citizen. So the first question that is raised is, would the judiciary entertain uh, an application for judicial review? Now, secondly, would the uh, governor general have the power to force a pr the prime minister out of office? That's the second question. And if he did, if the governor general attempted or actually ac exercised certain powers, whatever those powers might be, to unseat a prime minister, would that decision then be reviewable by the courts? So I've got three questions there related to this question here. Because those three questions are not in the Constitution. But obviously, these are things that have actually occurred in the history of the Australian government. So let's begin with that first question there. So, uh, so what was the first question there? Yeah, okay. Um, so there was somebody questioning the continuing stay in office of the Prime Minister on the ground that the Prime Minister has lost the support of Parliament and therefore should not have con continued to stay in office. So there... So they're occupying the office illegally. And there is a, a writ of co warranto in administrative law, which is available to, in, in order for, to determine the legality of the continuing in office of a government official. So let's begin with that first question there. Would the judiciary entertain that kind um, I think I think the judiciary won't entertain this kind of question. Yes. Uh, it's a... Uh, because it's actually nowhere in the constitution that even mentions the prime minister. Um, and he's appointed by the governor and the, therefore it, it, there's nothing illegal with him continuing to serve uh, at all. Okay. So uh, B would be right in that regard. That again is an example of a political question that is best left to the uh, elected members of uh, government to decide. The, uh, the wouldn't it, yes, Karen. Wouldn't it also be the case that the court can only act on what is written, and so where it, we are talking about things by convention that aren't written, there's nothing for them to say. Well, you've broken section eighty-two A, whatever, whatever. So, uh, not 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 exactly because, as I said. Conventional practices are actually deemed to be constitutional conventional practices so that they actually carry legal weight. So even if they might not be in writing, courts do recognize the existence of certain conventions and they are, they are law. So the main reason why the judiciary will not touch that question as to whether or not the prime minister uh, is legally, uh, legally continues to stay in office, it is because it is a political question which the judiciary um, as appointed members will desist from entertaining. So that's one. Now, I, so I'll go on to the next question. There is nothing in, um, there is nothing, uh, it would seem the constitution, which talks about, in the first place, the prime minister. So let's assume that the governor general uh, decides to somehow exercise certain prerogative powers and unseats a prime minister either because the prime minister has lost, um, has lost the support of parliament or because the, the, um, the governor general feels 
that the prime minister, while continuing to the support of government, has has acted in a manner that is inimical to the interests of Australia. So my question is, in relation to that second question, would there be any anything within the power of the? Uh, would there be? Would, would the governor general probably have a power? And where does that power come from if it does exist? Would it have the power to actually force out of office a prime minister, given the fact that the prime minister is actually chosen by parliament? Would there be an answer? Scott Wellburn, is that, um, is that just the problem of the plan through common law? Sorry, um, I, I missed something there. Um, Scott, can you repeat yourself? Uh, is that the... Is that the prerogative of the Crown because the, the um, Governor General is the Crown's representative and isn't that the prerogative of the Crown under common law to exercise that power? Mm. Uh, no, it's actually not because of common law prerogatives. It's more of by convention. Now, so let me just, because you've raised that point, let me just make a distinction because people might get confused the, between the distinction between common law prerogatives and um, conventional practices. So when you speak of common law prerogatives or common law uh, inherent powers or residual powers, we're actually said, saying that there are certain powers which common law courts through the years recognize to inhere in the executive so that the executive has residual inherent prerogative powers which are recognized by the court. So that's why they're called common law prerogative uh, or residual powers. Now, the notion of convention is different because although the common law courts recognize uh, these conventional practices, it's really an offshoot of the historical practice that uh, the parliament and the executive have developed and which that they have observed that brings legitimacy and legality to these uh, practices so that they actually are deemed to be law itself. So on the one hand, the notion of um, executive prerogative powers is as a result of its, uh, the recognition of those powers by the common law courts, historical, historically, because we don't have common law courts now. On the other hand, when we speak of by convention, it is a result of long-standing practices observed, adhered to, and respected by both the executive and parliament. So those are two different you know, um, sets of laws. So, going back to that question, do you suppose, given the fact that it is not in the Constitution, do you suppose, because this has happened in the past, uh, when Governor General uh, Stephen Kerr um, actually forced uh, Prime Minister Kof Whitlam, I don't know how, how you pronounce that, out of office as Prime Minister in the 1970s. So then if it's been, it's been done before, it would be by convention then. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So that's an example of by convention. It is by convention. So there is a recognition that uh, the governor general does have that power. A convention, it's a, it's a practice recognized and observed both by the prime minister and the parliament that that power resides in the governor general. Now the tricky part there is because it is not in the constitution, and neither is it in, in law, in statute, would actually have been possible for the prime minister to refuse to honor the decision of the governor general. Wouldn't that be correct? It's not. It's not there. So the, the prime minister yeah, can say, I refuse to recognize your decision. He, I suppose he could have, but then would he have lost the support of parliament then? He wouldn't. So that, that's the point. The Prime Minister couldn't because of the, the, the long-standing tradition. It's like you're going against the ideals of democracy. It just can't be done. In the same manner that uh, while in other countries, it's typical for, you know, in, in Turkey, for example, you had an attempted coup d'etat. Can you imagine a coup staged by the Australian Armed Forces? Or even in the US, can you imagine a coup d'etat um, staged by the military? It's very unlikely because there are certain institutional practices and traditions that simply make it impossible for these things to happen. And so therefore the idea that the prime minister will go against 
the exercise of a power by the governor general, um, stripping him of his office as prime minister, it goes against the very notion of what parliamentary democracy represents. So the prime, even the prime minister wouldn't do it. And he wouldn't get the support of members of parliament when it came to that, because it would lead to a constitutional crisis. Okay, so that's why, as I said, con convention is really very important. It might not be written in the constitution, but as a practice, it is deemed to be a constitutional convention because it is just as strong and as weighty as whatever is written in the constitution. So the third question was, would it have been possible, therefore, to go to the courts for the purpose of questioning the legality of the action of the governor general and seating uh, a prime minister from office on the ground that the governor general, who is not an elected um, member of, uh, of the government, and, does, and in a sense, you can say that he does not really represent the people because he has not been elected. Would it have been possible, would the courts have entertained such kind of a question? questioning the legality of the exercise by the governor general of his power to remove from office a prime minister. What do you think? Um, man, Joe, uh, Peter Anson. Um, in the case of John Kerr and, and Gough Whitlam, yes. um, they wouldn't have, but didn't, Kerr go to the judiciary to determine if it was legal before he dismissed uh, Whitlam. Ah, so yes. Although it isn't coming from the other direction, it can come from the Governor General. Yeah. So as a historical fact, what 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 had actually happened was that Governor John Kerr uh, went to the Chief Justice of the High Court to ask for an advice to determine whether or not he actually had the power to unseat or to remove from office uh, Prime Minister uh, Gough Whitlam. Now, because we're talking about, you know, these constitutional questions, and I would imagine it's relevant, the question is, was it proper in the first place for the, gov for the Governor General to even go to the Chief Justice of the High Court? And secondly, would you say that it was also proper for the Chief Justice to actually provide advice, to give advice, to the governor general. So there are two aspects there. The governor general going to the high court, chief, the chief justice of the high court, and the chief justice giving informal advice. It wasn't formal. It was an informal advice of the governor general. Either way, in either of those situations, was that proper for either of them to have done what they did? Uh, probably not, because again, it's a political... Uh situation or a political question that needs to be asked mm. and the judiciary should stay clear of that. That's right. So you're right there, Peter. So let's begin first with um, the action of, of uh, Governor General John Kirk. I mean, there was nothing that would have prevented uh, the Governor General from approaching anyone he wanted to. So there's no one, there's nothing that would prevent the Governor General from approaching anyone. He could. Okay, he could seek advice from anyone. But the question was, the question is, would it have been proper for Chief Justice Mason, for example, who was then the Chief Justice of the High Court, to actually provide informal advice to the, to the um, Governor General? And it is the view of some that it wasn't really proper because we will later on see, uh, as we move, I think, on to week seven or eight, when, rather week six and seven, when we look at the, um, the powers of the judiciary, we will observe that judicial review can only be exercised when there is an actual controversy, mainly because it is uh, based on Article 75 of the Constitution that the High Court may only exercise its judicial power when there is a matter. And a ma there is only a matter when there is an actual controversy involving parties where there are certain rights, uh, privileges uh, that, that have been affected or impaired. Now, in relation, therefore, to the approach by the um, by Governor General John Kerr to the uh, Chief Justice of the High Court, there was no actual controversy. That was a theoretical question, and we will realize we will we will later on hear uh, as we go through, for example, the uh, Victorian Stevedoring Dorian case, that hypothetical questions and theoretical questions are questions that courts will not entertain 
and I'm speaking of federal courts, by the way, that federal courts, that federal courts will not entertain because of the constraints as founded in the Constitution, that the, the, the exercise of judicial power can only be done when there is a matter which, me, which has been defined as uh, an actual controversy involving parties whose rights, privileges, and legitimate expectations have been impaired or have been affected. But again, that is a historical anomaly so that a lot of uh, political commentators and constitutionalists would argue that on the basis of those times, it was something that needed to be done. But no one questioned, you know, th their actions. Could, oh. could he have uh, approached the Attorney General or who, like, I know this is a bit off topic, yes. but who, who would he have approached for that advice? Would, you know, you'd, you'd have to approach someone with some sort of standing and some significant experience. Would that be the Attorney General? No, because the, in, the, in the first place, the Attorney General is part of the executive. I, yeah. So, although uh, the notion of, the notion of um, in a parliamentary democracy, you actually have the notion of primus inter pares, the prime minister is first among equals. In a sense, the Attorney General, at the end of the day, actually reports to the Prime Minister. He's beholden to the Prime Minister because it is the Prime Minister appoints him, although the, the appointment is formalized by the Governor General. So it can't be the Attorney General. Now, what perhaps could have happened is that by convention, what the Governor General actually does is he enters into consultation with the at least the heads of, of the two major political parties to determine who can form a government. So potentially, and I imagine this is what actually happened, who replaced Gough Whitlam after that? He actually talked to um, the next prime minister to determine if he had the numbers to be able to form a government. Okay, because uh, the appointment of the prime minister, for example, is always upon the advice of, of the parliament, who, you know, who carries the numbers. Okay, so in other words, um, even though in theory, by convention, there are certain things that the governor general can do, there are also constraints. So in other words, if the Governor General uh, oversteps his powers, um, potentially, uh, the exercise of his powers can actually be questioned as a proper constitutional law question in the courts. That may not become a political question if what then becomes involved is the unconstitutional exercise of power. It no longer becomes a merely a political question. But we haven't come to that yet, to that point. It never came to that point. Okay, um, question four, does the executive have quasi-lawmaking powers? And before we answer the question, we, it begs the question, what exactly does quasi-lawmaking powers mean? And does the executive have quasi-lawmaking powers? Volunteers? Quasi, why do you say it's quasi? So almost like something like lawmaking powers. What exactly does that mean? And does the executive have it? Because we know that um, the constitution vests the power to make laws in parliament. The question is, does the executive have the power to make laws? So in particular, for example, we have a question of would it be legal and constitutional for parliament, for example, to delegate some of the powers to make laws to the executive? That's one question. And in addition, even outside of parliament delegating certain uh, legislative powers to the executive, would the executive have powers of its own, inherent prerogative powers of its own to make laws? Not statutes, but laws. In other words, because they form laws of the land which command recognition and observance by the people. Uh, hi, Manager. Um, who was that? I, I need you, someone Zoom doesn't tell me straight away who's talking. So if you could just identify yourself, please. Tiffany? Tiffany, yes. Tiffany. Tiffany, sorry, Tiffany Wilkins, um, yes, go ahead. So, is this where they basically, um, under the constitution are able to delegate bodies to make rules and reg regulations. So like, mm -hmm. um, 
councils that can make now rules. That's the whole quasi law making power. Yes, that's right. That's it. Question. First question would be, so assuming that were to happen, um, would that be valid for parliament, for example, to delegate certain law making powers to the executive? Yeah, because they're allowed to, um, the constitution allows them to do that. And then- Wait, 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 wait. does the constitution, does the constitution actually say that? Does the constitution state that the parliament may delegate some of its powers to the executive? Does the constitution say that? No, it doesn't. No, no it doesn't. Okay. It oh. doesn't. So is that a convention then, or is that just built through common law through the courts? Or I'm a bit confused on that. Um, be before we get there, uh, hold on. There, there was a question that I wanted to ask, and uh, I'm beginning to lose it. Um, yeah, so it's not in the Constitution. But, and oh, yeah, the, the notion, the idea that the, the one I was raising was the notion of separation of powers. Isn't it dangerous? to recognize as valid an act on the part of parliament to delegate some of its lawmaking powers to the executive. Wouldn't that violate the idea of uh, separation of powers? Because, you know, a, a strong, vibrant democracy recognizes that it is best that the legislative, executive, and judicial powers should be vested in three different sets of, of bodies. If the more that you concentrate powers in, in one entity, the bigger is the likelihood that you end up with a despot or some kind of a dictator, an autocrat. So the first question is, would it be, do you suppose that the idea that um, parliament is able to vest or delegate some of its lawmaking powers to the executive, doesn't that run counter to the idea of uh, separation of powers? Um, hi, this is B, and I, I agree with you. I think it does c run counter to the separation of powers. Mm. It definitely does, but uh, as it is, the, the current uh, Westminster system doesn't have a complete separation uh. between the executive and the legislative anyway. And I think uh, I've written down there in some of the high, high court cases like Victorian Steve Doring, mm. they have sort of, the court has recognized that for the practicalities of everyday government, uh, the government should be allowed to make regulations, statutory rules and bylaws that actually have the full force and effect of, of any um, act that is passed by parliament. Perfect, thank you B. So B got it right. Um, she was able to identify the Dignas case, which is the Victorian Steve Doring case or the Dignas case. Thank you, B. That's correct. Now, there's a, there's a second dimension to the notion of quasi-lawmaking powers. And, that question, and the, question, the question there is, does the executive have the power to make certain laws even in the absence of a uh, delegation of those powers by the parliament? Or would the so-called quasi-lawmaking powers of the uh, executive be limited to those that have been uh, delegated to it by the parliament. What do you think? Doesn't I, I cannot see the chat box here somehow. Uh, hold on, am I able to do that? Yes, who was that? Uh, it's uh, Scott Wellburn, Manjo. Yes, Scott. Uh, doesn't the executive have uh, limited powers in the first place in relation to military power, foreign affairs power, police power? Mm -hmm. or, okay, go on. Go so, on. so they they automatically have had that power to to you know police power, uh, military power, foreign affairs, contracts, uh, mm. power to enter relations with um, other countries, and so on and so forth. Yes, go on. So, yeah. how are and then they can not making powers. Sorry, how do those how do those um, prerogative powers link to the idea of quasi lawmaking powers? Those are still executive powers. They're not lawmaking powers. Yeah, well, they they can. Um, uh, it's it's more administrative decision, so they can. Um, uh, you know, uh, like create regulations for licensing and that sort of thing. 
Yes, go on. You're actually in the right direction. I'm just, I'm just trying to probe deep, deeper here. Go on. You're actually in the right direction. Yeah. So they, they make the like the statute as such, and then you yeah. have the regulations that relate yes. to that statute. So then, other bodies can then develop the regulations and be more specific about yeah. what it needs or, or how they or how it's going to comply with that regulation to comply with the statute. That's right. So actually, you're correct. You're very much correct. So um, what, what it actually means is that, um, as pointed out here by, uh, by Scott, it is typical for the executive to actually um, craft and pass regulations that affect the people. And those regulations uh, may actually be on subjects that are not based on a delegated legislative authority. So typically, uh, when we speak of quasi lawmaking powers, it's actually the power of the executive to enact legislation on the basis of delegated authority from parliament. In that case, what we have would be subordinate legislation as opposed to primary legislation coming from the parliament. But in addition to those sets of laws, delegated laws that um, the executive uh, enacts, the executive does uh, uh, come up with regulations. It could be regulations about Medicare, it could be regulations about benefits, which have which may have little to do with a delegated authority, but it's actually by virtue of the exercise of the prerogative powers of the executive. So, for example, a determination as who can become members of the military. Should do you allow gay uh, soldiers in the military? That is in the nature of a law. That regulation will be in the nature of a law because it affects the rights and may, have, may create certain liabilities on the part of the individual. So it is a law because it carries the weight of legal authority and uh, it is a command that people have to observe. So it is a law. But the question is, on what basis does the executive have to exercise that power? It is on the understanding that the executive does have certain prerogative powers. And part of it would be that quasi-lawmaking power to come up with regulations that are that actually have the standing of law. Okay, good. Um, let's move on. Now, does the executive have quasi judicial powers? What exactly does quasi judicial powers mean in the first place? Volunteers. Now, remember what, what I'm actually doing here, and I hope I hope this is something that you've been used to. Uh, I make it a habit to actually just probe because it's a way for you to practice. You know, uh, when you're going to be lawyers, you're going to be involved in the art of advocacy. You're going to be arguing and trying to persuade juries or persuade the judge. So we might as well get into the habit of you know responding to probing questions. Yeah, well, the sorry, it's Scott Wellburn again. Yes. Um, yeah, the the executive does have quasi judicial powers. They can, like we've just discussed, that they can make uh, laws and and um, rules uh, which govern the rights of people. Um, I think just I'll just have to find it. Um, I think that was Australian Communist Party and Commonwealth. Okay. Um, you, you're there. Now, Brad, you mentioned QCAT, and that is a state legislation, but, you know, you're in the right direction there, Brad. Brad Corby, would you like to pick up the mic? Brad? Because I see in the chat box you put something in there about QCAT. Okay, Brad. I'm not sure. Is my mic working? It is working now. I could hear you. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. oh okay. Because it was telling me it wasn't working. Okay. I could test it. Yes. Um, yeah, because Q, QCAT um, is an administrative tribunal, mm. um, essentially not based on law, even though you can seek an appeal if there is a, is a error, in, error in law made by the um, administrative officer. Mm. Um, so... Essentially, many of the decisions um, 
decided by QCAT are not essentially based on good law. So I, I suggest that um, you know the, the executive makes an appointment of these um, um, administrative officers who don't necessarily have to be judicial officers mm. um, that have similar powers to a judicial officer. I recall from having done our admin law with you that we went through a number of exercises um, um, in regards to um, administrative decisions. Okay. So even though, even though um, the decision... Um, you can you can seek an appeal on a QCAT decision to go to a judicial officer at, at the magistrates, but there has to be an error in the law. Um, so I'm sort of saying that um, you know they are um, working in a quasi judicial um, powers. Okay, thank you, Brad. Um, so l let me just amplify on Brad what Brad has said. Now, the first thing that I need to flag here is that the example given by, by Brad was in relation to QCAP, which is the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal. It is a tribunal created by the state of Queensland. So it is not a federal body. Now, so let's begin with that. Let's begin with the idea, and I suppose we're discussing this a bit later, later on, but since we've touched that, the notion of separation of powers doesn't really exist in, in, in the states, which means, therefore, that it's permissible for a judge of a state court to actually exercise um, non-judicial powers. It's legal, okay, because the notion of separation of powers, of powers does not exist in the states. However, in relation to the federal government, we have this notion, the idea of the partial separation of powers, and the High Court has been very vigilant in any attempt to encroach into judicial powers. And if you follow the Boilermakers case, the High Court is saying, one, that the executive cannot um, exercise uh, judicial powers, and two, the parliament or the executive cannot vest non-judicial powers in the judiciary. Okay, so that's according to the Boilermakers case, which again, that scenario doesn't apply to the states. So let's just focus for now on, on, the, on, the, on the level of the federal government. So as a, as a matter of constitutional law, uh, the court in the Boilermakers case, and I wonder if this was discussed here, but we'll be discussing it on, has been quite clear that judicial power can only be exercised by Chapter 3 courts. That is, courts that have been constituted according to Chapter 3 of the Australian Constitution. Judicial power cannot be exercised by non-Chapter 3 courts. And uh, the High Court has uh, also emphasized that, the exercise, that judicial power is only exercised in relation to matters, which has been defined as an actual controversy involving uh, persons or individuals or corporations whose rights, interests, or legitimate expectations have been affected or impaired. Now, so that is what we mean by uh, the exercise of judicial power, and we said what we've discussed what matter is all about. Now, in relation, therefore, to quasi-judicial tribunals, and we speak, for example, of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, or uh, if you speak, for example, of the internal review mechanism of the Medicare, because they do make decisions that affect the rights of people, don't they? They do. The AAT does that. But the distinction is that in relation to the AAT or the internal re uh, review mechanism of, uh, let's say, the Medicare, although there might be a, a dispute as to rights, it does not involve an actual controversy between individuals. Because what has happened, as far as the AAT is concerned, is actually the, the, uh, the impact of uh, laws or regulations passed by parliament or the executive and its impact on the rights of people. But there is no controversy between private litigants themselves. So if there is an actual controversy between party litigants, 
or private individuals and corporations, for example, if there is an actual controversy, only Chapter 3 courts have a jurisdiction over those matters. So therefore, in, in, in relation to uh, where there is no actual controversy, then that is an instance when there might be administrative tribunals that do render decisions. But those decisions are in relation to what you might call cases, but this would involve this wouldn't involve actual controversies between private individuals or, let's say, corporations. So if the question is, does the executive have quasi-judicial powers? Uh, yes, it does, because it is permissible, for example, for parliament to uh, vest in the executive the power, or actually it's the executive, which creates certain tribunals. And these tribunals then report typically to the attorney general, or at least to the, cab to, to, the, to the prime minister and the executive. But these administrative tribunals may, in a sense, uh, perform uh, certain quasi-judicial powers, not true or real judicial powers, because the, the ones that they adjudicate on do not involve actual controversies. But they have a semblance of the exercise of judicial powers because they do make a determination as to the legality, for example, or the correctness of certain decisions made by the executive. Okay. Questions? Anything else you may want to clarify? Ah, so just clarifying, Chapter 3 Courts is the High Court uh, from Latisha. Uh, as far as the Constitution is concerned, the High Court is specifically uh, identified as a, a Chapter 3 Court. But uh, the Constitution also, also provides that the Parliament may, may, um, may create such other federal courts as it deems fit. So uh, the Federal Court of Australia, for example, or the Federal Circuit Court are not specifically identified uh, in the Constitution or by the Constitution as Chapter 3 courts. But uh, Chapter 3 of the Constitution recognizes the power of the parliament to create other federal courts. So other federal courts that have been created, therefore, would be the Federal Circuit Court, the Federal Court of Australia, as well as the Family Court of Australia. These are examples of uh, Chapter 3 courts, therefore. And the reason why it's crucial for us to identify them as Chapter 3 courts is because there is a process by which uh, these judges are appointed. And there are uh, constitutional guarantees in relation to their remuneration as well as their tenure in office. As opposed to uh, judges or uh, tribunal members or members of uh, administrative tribunals such as the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, these individuals, because they are not Chapter 3 courts, their manner of appointment, their termination, rules about their, their remuneration, remuneration rests solely with the parliament. So therefore, the, to a great extent, what the administrative tribunals do are very much within the control of the parliament and the executive. But certainly not in relation to chapter three courts because chapter three courts are fully and totally independent from both the executive and the parliament. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Questions? So I guess that's it. It's 7.17. If there, are, there isn't any other question, I'd like to end tonight's tutorial, and I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. If there are any other questions that you might have, anything you'd like to, um, to ask or have clarified, feel free to send me an email, and uh, I will respond to it as soon as I could. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, good night. I'll see you. I hope to see you again on Thursday. Bye.